Germany. As a coordinator of the Alice Lehmann Learning Foundation, I welcome you here to the lesson of Economy and Market. I would like to welcome you on behalf of uh, Mr. Francesco Maldoni, the President of the Foundation, and Mr. Giamaglio Spacca. Mr. Spacca is not only the President of the Division, he will he wanted to talk as the director of the Marke, Economia Marche magazine. Those of them welcome me here. They couldn't come when we set the date of the lesson. We took into account the distance from the lessons so that they were freer. But um, they had uh, other commitments in these me weeks, so they couldn't come. Before a short introduction uh, to a lesson with Professor Aldrich, I would like to ta uh, ask uh, to pass the floor to Mr. Macchetti for a welcome from the university. Thank you. Thank you for th I would like to thank uh, the Maroni Foundation for this opportunity that is offered to have a lesson here. I'd like to thank Mr. Aldrich. We had a long uh, discussion yesterday. I'd like to thank him again uh, for his presence here. The colleagues that had the opportunity to be present at the inauguration of the um, academic year, maybe you remember that I mentioned some of the works of Mr. Aldrich that uh, inspire our actions, strategic actions, uh, in managing uh, also the university. In the talks we had uh, yesterday with Mr. Aldrich, not only we are interested in what he does, but also the professor is interested in the way in which we developed in this years our university model. We showed him some peculiarities of the university that make it unique at the national level. So, it's a, very, uh, it's a great pleasure to have him here. It will be very interesting. You will see his view on uh, the entrepreneurial society and also um, uh, the university at the center. Thank you, David, for this, and thank you all for being here with us today. <laughs> A few minutes uh, um, for the presentation, and then I would like to pass the floor to David Ozesh. I would like to remind you that this lesson, our economy market, is in a series of lessons that started more than 25 years ago of lessons. This uh, way in which the community brings international renowned professors on in interesting topics. It's been more than 25 years. The lesson today is the magazine Economy Market and these contributions of them are published in the magazine. We are trying also to prepare all these texts for these lessons on the university website. This is a special moment for the university because uh, as uh, the logo says, uh, it's the 50th anniversary. The university was founded in 1963. For this 50th anniversary, we thought about David Aldrich when we studied entrepreneurship because uh, since the beginning, the aim of the foundation was the promotion of entrepreneurial culture. This is the, the aim and the vision of the foundation. In the next days, we had also a direct support uh, to the businesses around the foundation. When the foundation started to promote uh, cultural events, and 
one of those who came to its uh, initial objective, that is to give a, a contribution to the entrepreneurial uh, development of Italy. In more than 25, in more than 50 years, Mr. Mahmoud Ranjou coordinated the university and replaced him. And only a few months ago, I'd like to thank him for this, uh, what he did for the university. There were different moments, very interesting moments in the foundation's history. I will not uh, waste them. We have just run updated the website of the foundation. If you want to see the activities we are developing now um, in the history of foundation, you can find them there. In 1976, uh, we founded uh, the Economy Market magazine, which became uh, the main tool through which the foundation gives contribution on the debate, especially on economy and uh, regional development. Last year, in 2012, uh, we renewed the magazine. The, the magazine has been, uh, was directed by Professor Pilon uh, uh, Sandrini, Balloni, Patinati. They are still in the scientific committee. Marco Kukulov is the new director, together with Mr. Stepes, but you and me. And among the news, uh, the new uh, parts of this magazine, we kept the spirit of the magazine intact. The journal of applied economics, it deals with applied economics and the regional environment. We put it online also, so the contents uh, since 2012 are also online. We hope uh, that the contents will uh, of previous magazines uh, will be available online as well. As you've seen, the lesson this year we chose the uh, role of entrepreneurship uh, because the first is uh, the, uh, the, the vision and the objective of the foundation. Yes. And we invited uh, Professor David Aldrich from Indiana University. At the beginning, I tried uh, to make some slides uh, to summarize uh, the academic titles and publications of uh, David Aldrich. And then I decided that maybe it would have been uh, too long uh, and I would have uh, probably forgotten uh, something. So I exploit uh, uh, communication tools. Uh, there are different website pages uh, on uh, Professor Rodrigo, so you can see on the Indian University website and see uh, his long academic career since the beginning 80 of the 80s. Professor Rodrigo worked also in uh, Europe and Germany, so he knows uh, also uh, the context, uh, the European context and also the American context, and he has academic positions in different universities in the world, so he will bring us not only the perspective of the US, but also he is a person that understands what happens in other contexts. David Aldrich, Professor Aldrich will um, also tell us something about him. But I think that uh, the main focus uh, for him was the analysis of process of innovation and advanced society and the role of, uh, you know, of the small companies in uh, this kind of innovation. This is very important for us because uh, we, especially in our country, we are seeing a big change in entrepreneurship. We have a problem of reduction of uh, businesses because the, the traditional model of, uh, of the employee, the worker, 
that uh, uh, with an experience after after an experience with a small company uh, starts a new business. Uh, well, uh, now we have uh, to push. Uh, we have to support uh, young people to open new businesses, new initiatives uh, in uh, high knowledge based uh, um, uh, sectors. Mr. Professor Aldrich focused on this aspect, so we thought to to call him for this lesson. And now I pass the floor. Well, thank you very much, Donato, for that very kind uh, introduction, but also for the very generous uh, and kind invitation to come here to Ancona, to the university, my first visit here. And everyone keeps telling me the weather is terrible and I should come when the weather is good, so I look forward to that. Uh, I also appreciate you introducing me to the to the rector, to the president of the university. As you said, we had very uh, very interesting, uh, uh, very uh, open discussion yesterday about uh, really the promise of the university, and it made me feel excited and proud to be at a university uh, uh, at this point of time in history. I just hope the feeling lasts until I get back to the other side of the Atlantic. And thank you also to the the foundation for sponsoring this this event and it certainly is a privilege to belong to a group of speakers that includes at least uh, the rector said at least uh, one Nobel Prize winner uh, we, we could see in there it's a very distinguished group well I spent the decade of the 1970s at the university several universities I was pursuing completing my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate, these degrees that has been inflicted on you and all of Europe, thanks to Bologna, right, if I understand this correctly. And uh, that's what I was doing at the in the 1970s. And when I think back to what it was like to be at the university back then, my recollection is that when I think of my professors, they were wonderful scholars, wonderful men, wonderful people, uh, what I remember is they all had basically the same uh, responsibility. It was equal, uh, uh, both in my department, but also really across the university. They all had the same research responsibilities, expectations. They all had the same teaching load. I can't remember the number of courses, of course. Uh, they all had the same expectations for committees. Uh, really, they were uh, uh, treated homogeneously uh, at that point, there was no talk, no awareness of any kind of responsibility or mission or activities outside the university, any kind of service outside the university. And, you know, you might wonder, well, where did I go to the university? Maybe, um, I don't know, maybe in Cologne or maybe in Paris. No, I was at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, which is a, uh, actually, uh, as I found out later, has one of the most important and Im high impact offices of technology transfer. It's called WARF, the Wisconsin um, Technology Transfer Office. Uh, but nobody heard about it then. Uh, it was a, uh, the, my sense of the American university, I know it wasn't just my university of, of Wisconsin, but all of the universities uh, could have been Stanford or North Carolina or Texas or Berkeley, uh, was really uh, something that I think would have been recognizable to Europeans. It was a very comfortable university. It was about teaching the students and what do we say? It was about knowledge for its own sake. You did research for its own sake, pursuing knowledge for its own sake. Um, and that actually made uh, sense uh, at that point in time. It was the traditional university, really the same model of the university that uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt had created or, or uh, liberated, really, 
in the uh, 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 1800s, von Humboldt's contribution was to free the university or to liberate the university from the shackles, from the chains of the state, the government, and also the church. I mean, we remember what happened to Copernicus, right? Copernicus followed knowledge for its own sake and came to the radical conclusion that the earth revolves around the sun and the masters, the church, uh, uh, just, about, uh, just about killed him. Um, well, Humboldt wanted to make sure that didn't happen, and his great contribution, among others, was to free the university so that there was this freedom to teach what the university felt was appropriate and to do research to pursue knowledge for its own sake. Uh, in some ways, he liberated the university from being accountable or having a, a being engaged with society. That's really the university that I got to know in my short time as a student, one decade. But I think that's the way American universities were pretty much uh, 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 throughout most of most of last last century. Uh, and that kind of role, that traditional role of the university, made sense in what you could call or understand to be the, the solo economy. Remember, uh, Robert Solo was awarded a Nobel Prize for explaining and analyzing, maybe not proving, but uh, uh, certainly contributing to where did the things we care about, economic growth, jobs, People didn't say competitiveness back then, but I guess now we say competitiveness. Where did this come from? And in the famous solo growth model, it was very clear. It came from two sources. Uh, physical capital, factories, machines, and you needed people to operate those machines, labor. Uh, I think that uh, if there's any scholars here of the uh, maybe the old school of macroeconomics, they would point out, well, there was, uh, uh, there was what Solo called uh, technological change in the model. But then they point out this was the residual in the regression. It's literally the residual. is the unexplained part. And so and it had a big impact actually on growth. But the Solo model said that what could exogenously be influenced was investments in physical capital, factories, and machines, then you throw in bodies, labor, to work those machines. And the technological change uh, what it was, was uh, a surprise. I think in a famous passage, he said, it falls like mana from heaven. I'm not sure what the policy conclusions were. Perhaps religion, perhaps pray. If you're lucky, it falls on you. And if you're not lucky, it falls some other place. But that wasn't very helpful for guiding policy. It was very clear in the solo model what drove growth, what drove jobs, what drove a high standard of living was investment in industries like the auto industry, um, the uh, steel industry, the tire industry, uh, apparel, clothes, and so on, where this physical plant uh, mattered a lot. What did this mean for the university? Well, we all, many of us work at universities, we've linked to universities, most of us have attended universities. We understand that universities can do many things, but it doesn't generate physical capital. It doesn't generate plants and factories. It may generate a lot of other things. So in the solo economy, an economy where what mattered was factories, uh, plants, machines, what was happening at the university seemed much more like consumption than investment. And I think that a lot of enlightened scholars, policymakers would say, no, this isn't consumption, it's investment. It's investment in, in promoting, furthering the culture, the political stability to the next generation. It was kind of an intergenerational transfer. I don't want to get into that debate. I know, though, from having been young at the time, many of the policymakers, at least in the United States, many of the parents I knew, said, Oh, go have fun at the university. It's consumption. Um, uh, very few people saw a link between growth and what was happening in the, at the university. And you could see that or you couldn't see that in the, uh, in the solo model. 
At best, it was in the residual, but that's why it was residual. It was unexplained. And I would say, when I think back to my education in the 70s, the bachelor level, studying industry, industrial economics, um, I remember reading about uh, Silo Slabini, actually, one of the great scholars. I'm not sure where he was from, Rome, I, I, I think, actually. Is that correct, Rome? And uh, one of the great scholars, and we read his work, among other scholars. We never read about, uh, uh, we barely read about innovation. We never read about entrepreneurship. They were off the radar. They were off the map. One of my PhD students a few years ago got out the Palgrave's Encyclopedia of Economics. Uh, actually, there's 15 volumes on every topic possible. And then she showed me the entries for innovation. There were a few, uh, for 17, 18. For entrepreneurship, there were three little entries, and it was really just entries about, well, this is business. Uh, historically, in economics, this was not something that would seem to matter or drive growth. Rather, what mattered, if you go back to the solo model, it was obvious. It was, it was uh, investment in large-scale uh, capital. That's what drove uh, the standard of living. Well, we know that uh, uh, this changed. It changed in the United States with what we called a competitiveness crisis. It was an economic crisis where those capital-intensive industries, autos, steel, uh, tires, were no longer competitive uh, against competitors in, in Japan largely and in, in uh, Europe, uh, Germany largely. And this represented really a shift in comparative advantage of the United States from physical capital, industries that are strong in physical capital, now we'd say to knowledge. And this is where uh, you could say the Romer economy or the endogenous growth models started to emerge, principally Paul Romer is probably uh, the most famous and is likely to win a Nobel Prize for his work on endogenous growth, where the university shifts from being uh, maybe at the margin of the economy, maybe irrelevant, not important to the economy, maybe important for society, but more of a cost than a contributor to economic growth and to jobs. But once knowledge starts to matter, uh, scholars didn't back then, I would say in the 80s or 90s, know exactly where knowledge comes from. I would dare say now we still are mystified by what is the source of knowledge. We think we model it has something to do with research and development. It has something to do with human capital, education, perhaps even more broadly culture uh, uh, and creativity. But we also think and model it has surely has something to do with the university. And this is implicit in the Romer model where the production of knowledge becomes endogenous in the model, hence the, the in, endogeneity in the growth uh, models. Uh, so that once knowledge became important for what society really, among other things, cared about, which was jobs, a standard of living, and growth, people started to look at the universities a little bit differently rather than just as a... Uh, uh, an institution that might be beneficial but is a drain on the economy, they start to look at the university as a producer of knowledge and therefore becomes important to the university. I know in the United States, because I was a student then and then a young assistant professor at this time during this crisis, for the first time since the Second World War, the universities ran out of money and experienced a shortfall. This was during the famous oil crisis of the 1970s. Prices went up. Energy costs went up, and the universities didn't have enough money. When they went to the governments, the state governments, the federal governments, and said, well, our costs are higher, the government said, so are ours. Good luck. So what the universities started to do was look around and, and, and said, well, what do we have that somebody will pay for and help finance? And, of course, in the United States, uh, the first thing they see are the students. They start to charge higher and higher and higher uh, tuition. Um, but they also realized that this knowledge that's being produced from science, from engineering, from ideas is valuable 
And so they started to, the universities became aware this is uh, potentially quite, quite valuable. But it turned out just producing knowledge at the university or other institutions, firms for that matter, just because you produce it doesn't mean it spills over. Because in the Romer growth models, the key mechanism driving growth wasn't just that knowledge contributes to growth, but it spills over from the firm or the university producing it so that other firms can use it too. But it turned out that it didn't just spill over automatically. In fact, here I think the growth models were wrong. They assume in the growth models that uh, if there's an investment in knowledge, it will spill over and generate growth. But a U.S. senator, uh, senator in, uh, uh, in the um, United States Senate, uh, Birch Bayh, observed way back in 1980, he observed a wealth of scientific talent at American colleges and universities talent responsible for the development of numerous innovative scientific breakthroughs each year is going to waste as a result of bureaucratic red tape and illogical government regulations. Then he went on to ask, what sense does it make to spend billions of dollars each year on government-supported research and then prevent new developments from benefiting the American people because of dumb bureaucratic red tape? Well, I'm sure none of us is here are in favor of dumb bureaucratic red tape, but what Birch was observing uh, was that just investing in science, in engineering, or in any knowledge, ideas, doesn't mean it gets spills over automatically to society to result in technology, innovations, and therefore drive growth in jobs. Rather, it was hitting what we call, we term, the kind of a barrier, uh, uh, not a barrier to entry. I remember Silo Sabini taught me, well, I read his book, he taught me about barriers to entry. This is not a barrier to entry, it's a barrier to spillover. The macroeconomic models, Romer, assumed that the spillover happened automatically. Why shouldn't they? Well, if you ask Birch Bay, he said it doesn't happen automatically. Um, so what's termed as the uh, knowledge filter is really this impediment or barrier for whatever, for lots of different reasons. Now, what uh, uh, by way back in 1979 that ended up being a, a law in 1980, what he observed or thought was the, causing this knowledge filter was actually the laws, the pro intellectual property rights that said essentially, if you pay for it, you own it. The it being the, the research, the intellectual property, so that the, um, if, if research was funded by the, federal government, maybe the National Science Foundation, maybe the Environmental Protection Agency, or maybe the, um, uh, maybe the uh, National Institutes of Health, billions and billions of dollars each year funding this research, they would, own the, they would own the intellectual property. So if somebody actually wanted to use the intellectual property maybe to innovate, they would have to be able, they would have to get a, a license from the owner of the intellectual property, which would be, could be from the Department of Defense. Could you imagine trying to negotiate with the Department of Defense to get an uh, intellectual property license on something very specific? It must have really been a bureaucratic nightmare. And so that uh, uh, Bai, together with his colleague Robert Dole, convinced the Congress to pass what's called the Bai Dole Act. I don't want to talk about it too much. It's a lot written on it. It essentially changed the property rights of inventions or of ideas away from the f funder, which would be the federal government, and instead told the universities, you can do what you want with this pro intellectual property rights. And in fact, it's interesting, different universities have chosen to do different things with these property rights. Most universities created offices of the technology transfer, and they would tell these offices, Typically, these offices at a big university, I, uh, you're at a nice small university here, I understand, 17,000 people. I feel I can put my arms around it. The, the president, the rector was telling me, my university is, uh, is 40,000. That's pretty big. But uh, uh, I understand the University of Rome is about, what, 50, 60,000? The University of Wisconsin what, is, is about that big. And in any case, these offices of technology transfer, maybe at three, four, five people working. 
They're responsible for uh, making decisions about what to do with the intellectual property. Uh, not all universities actually, pretty much by now, they've all created offices of technology transfer. Couple, some universities actually just tell the scientists, the end, or anybody, is commercialize, do what you want. We don't really want to get involved very often. Um, Purdue University the, has a president who just said the property rights belong to the scientists. More typically, the university makes a decision. Uh, it requires by law uh, that the, every employee has to fill out what they call a disclosure form where we disclose our ideas that could be invention. So every year, I dutifully fill out a form and I put down all my great ideas and I submit it and every year I get an email back and they say, this is an interesting, thank you. Uh, and this is actually what they send to most people. Because if you have a small office of three or four people, you can't pursue most of these ideas. Um, in any case, after the Bayh-Dole Act, uh, uh, scholars, uh, social scientists, economists, uh, sociologists, started to analyze the impact of the Bayh-Dole Act by asking what are these technology transfer offices doing? In fact, there was a countrywide, a national association called the uh, Associ uh, uh, Autumn, Association of University Technology Managers. They collected all of the data from the technology transfer offices. So, and you can go online. If you just type in Autumn, you can download the data. And you can see for each university how many licenses it gives out, how many patents it gives out, how many startups are coming from the technology uh, transfer office. Well, oh yeah. The idea was that with this new property rights that assign the intellectual property to the university and the, I guess you could say, institutional mechanism of a technology transfer office, this would change the university from the traditional Humboldt model of a university to maybe what some people might call an entrepreneurial university where the focus is not only or exclusively knowledge for its own sake, but knowledge because it can make a contribution to some problem in society. Uh, and of course, if that problem can be patented or the solution and licensed, that's even better, the university can make uh, can make money. So the university really shifted as being isolated from the university in a way behind uh, a walls almost to the way I guess the city used to be behind walls back during the Roman time. Uh, uh, instead the university emerged as uh, a solution provider to provide solutions to problems where there's a demand for a solution. In that sense, the universe, parts of the university became user-oriented. Uh, so that rather than just do research and teaching and inquiry uh, for its own sake, knowledge for its own sake, instead it became knowledge because it's valuable to society in some way. And that's a shift in the role of the university, I think, in this uh, entrepreneurial uh, economy. Um, the university started to provide conduits to try to help the spillover of knowledge, uh, not just the technology transfer offices, but perhaps you've heard of, and I, I'm sure that this university has them as well, incubators, science parks, offices of sponsored research, a ways of reaching out into society and identifying where's the need and how can the university provide solutions for that need. So we made up this little picture um, uh, of the universe of the entrepreneurial university this core would be um, traditional disciplines uh, I said basic research but that's probably the wrong word what I'm really thinking of in that core are the types of subjects that I remember at the university physics philosophy um, maybe French I don't know economics probably I remember economics being very theoretical it wasn't it was about knowledge for its own sake uh, that's still there in contemporary American universities. But around it has come the second ring that you could say is applied 
research, applied meaning, it's, this is knowledge for its own sake. That's what I remember in my graduate studies in economics. We were not necessarily trying to improve or under, the, the economy, we were trying to make models that had their own elegance and beauty. Over here, this is about knowledge because it will help solve some problem. It could be to a business, it could be to some component of society, it could be a, a health product, uh, a medicine, it could be valuable, in which case the university might actually earn a return. Um, so there's a very different motive for doing the, the research, the teaching, and I guess I would venture uh, all schools of business, schools of engineering are in here. Uh, uh, I would say that they're uh, focused out here, not on just knowledge for its own sake. The technology transfer offices, the um, incubators, the science parks, the offices of engagement, they're called sometimes. These are all mechanisms the university has built since then because this wasn't enough to get the spillovers out. You had to actually help push them through trying to start firms, through trying to uh, make connections to uh, uh, organizations outside of the university. This is the boundary of the university. And I think what we can observe uh, in the last 30 years or so, or 40 years, is the growth of what you could call absorptive capacity mechanisms. These would be institutions that are not part of the university, but they're there to try to reach into the university, get that knowledge, and then get it commercialized in society. Lots of examples in the United States. I know in Europe there are as well. I'm, I'm sure there are in Italy, but I, there's so many examples. I think of the Georgia Research Alliance in the city of Atlanta. There's some great universities, Emory University, um, um, Georgia Tech. Uh, University of Georgia is not far away, and, and many more universities, small universities. Well, the state created the Georgia Research Alliance and funds them what they do is work with the university. They try to identify potential innovations uh, uh, and then get those uh, ideas out into the marketplace. And they've generated a fair number of patents, licenses, and startups. And most, uh, most states have these now. And I think most around the world, we see more and more institutions like this. I'm sure you can think of some, some here. So to me, this is whatever you call it, this is the university that I went to. This is what I remember from back in the 1980s. I'm nostalgic. I miss it. I'm not sure that I like this new world better, but I can't get this to go away. And it is interesting, as we discussed yesterday, and it's needed by society, not just to cure cancer, of course, that's important too, but also as a generator of uh, innovation and growth well, scholars that started to look at what was the impact of this Bayh-Dole uh, Act, this law, that was passed in 1980. And when you look at the patents, this is pat uh, the share of patents at U.S. universities uh, as, a, as a share of the total, you can see in 1980 it, it explodes upwards um, uh, and has just continued to increase over time. So it looks like there was a big increase in patenting activity. That's true. But then some of the critics of the Bayh-Dole Act say, but if you look at the number of patents, you see an incredible skew. This is the University of California. That's a little unfair because they put all the campuses of one university, Berkeley and UCLA and Irvine and so on. Um, how can, uh, how can uh, New York University is one? But anyway, that's a measurement issue. University of Texas, probably the same thing. Here's my alma mater, Wisconsin, I'm proud to say is three. But even by the time you get down to uh, just I don't know, 10 universities, you see that the number of patents has gone way down. That is to say, it looks like, yes, Bayh-Dole Act had a big impact, but it looks like the impact of really spurring these spillovers may have been concentrated on just a few, a few industries. Then when we start looking at the licensing income, this is what the technology transfer offices really, at least until now, have felt as their main task to take this intellectual property that the university, the Bayh-Dole Act gave to the university, they need money. And Columbia has gotten a lot of money in 2009, Northwestern, New York University, the California system. But as you go down, it, you can see it falls off pretty fast so that most universities 
really don't, uh, don't uh, generate a lot of revenue from technology. What about entrepreneurship, firms that are started from the university? Well, if you go down, I should, if I were younger, I would uh, call up the web page of Autumn and impress you how easy it is to access these data. What we see over the last 10 years is uh, a mean of about 426 university startups from, from the American universities. Now, I know, you know, in Ancona, which is a beautiful, lovely town, but not giant. Right, 426 startups seems, you, you'd be thrilled to have 426 startups from here at the university. But of course, this is for the United States. It's a big country with lots and lots of universities. It doesn't seem like really a lot of startups for all the research and development. Then when you look at the individual universities, MIT has about 29 startups uh, a year over the last decade. You know, that's again, seems like a lot. MIT is about as impressive as a technology university as you can get. Look at Stanford, there's only six. That's better than uh, Indiana University. We don't have very many at all. I know uh, a little over one, I think, a year. And so for all of this euphoria about Baidol and the commercialization of the universities in America, it starts looking not so good. Uh, my, one of my uh, co-authors on my team for this research, he we were out to, to dinner, and so he calculated on the, 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 uh, the napkin. He said, well, if there's uh, uh, about 426 startups, and there's so much research done at American universities, on average, this is costing $368 million of R&D to get one startup. I'm not sure how meaningful that is, but it doesn't paint a picture that says there's a lot of commercialization and entrepreneurship coming from most American universities. There's success stories. But one of the problems with this measurement is in the whole, is, is with, with me or with us, with our community um, of scholars who in our rush to, in euphoria to try to analyze how has the university changed, we went to the easiest source of data the technology transfer offices, or this national association, the, the Autumn, the Association of University Technology Managers. Uh, a number of scholars have pointed out recently, they said, well, what if there's more happening at the university than is being reported by the technology transfer offices? Not because they're hiding anything, but because they're doing their job. They have maybe three or four, I should know how many people are at Indiana University. I know I know them all. Um, uh, uh, it's a handful. They're nice people. They had some education, I don't know, maybe an MBA. Now they have to figure out which scientific, which chemistry uh, uh, breakthrough do they think is going likely to result in a patent and licensing. It's a tough job. Mostly what they tell the, the scientists, the engineers, the colleagues, they say, this is great, but we're not going to pursue it. What this means is the scientist is left to do what they want with it. And you can see here from a study uh, that was published in the journal Business Venturing, the focus of these technology transfer offices has been on uh, uh, trying to accrue revenues for licenses so that the university gets money. That means if a scientist has a kind of invention that maybe can't, cannot be patented it, but maybe it's valuable, the technology transfer office is likely to say, no, no, we don't want to pursue it. And then nobody really knows what the scientist does with it. I was talking to this colleague. This is a, a picture of him. His name is Jeff Alberts uh, 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 in an article written up in Nature Magazine, making the switch from science to business. That's actually, it occurs to me now, that's the wrong title. Jeff Alberts is a psychology professor when I was hired at Indiana University, he was the vice president for sponsored research. He was in charge of getting grants, getting contracts with firms. And when I, I met him, uh, uh, I thought he'd ask me, well, how was my move? And was my family getting adjusted to the new, the new town, Bloomington? No, no, he just talked about, he was so excited. He had just started a firm, uh, uh, Star Alliance, and they make, uh, they made, uh, cages for animals 
in the space shuttle. So he had just come from a, a, a launch at NASA where his product, this, this, this cage, was going up into space. And uh, this was from his firm that he started. He said, and I, I asked him why he started the firm. He said, well, NASA, he wanted to do the, the research and create the product, and NASA said they could only fund him if he started a firm. So he started a firm. He became an entrepreneur. And why it occurs to me that's the wrong title in the Nature magazine is because he didn't make the switch from science to business. He was, in a way, my boss back then. He was a psychology professor. He's still a psychology professor. The title should have been uh, doing science and business. He was doing both, and he seemed to be energized and, and excited and happy, and uh, uh, he, still, he still is. The only thing I could never understand, he's a psychology professor. I couldn't understand why he was making cages for animals in space, but I'll have to ask him that. So after talking to him and people like him, I started to realize he, even though he's really almost in charge of the technology transfer office, his own company, his entrepreneurial company, wasn't in the technology, it was not in the database because it didn't go through the technology transfer office. There really was no patent, there's no license, so we started the company. And he stayed as a professor and, uh, uh, and I think at one point had 30 employees in the company. So we decided that there was a problem maybe not with the entrepreneurship coming from the university or the technology transfer, there was a problem in my own community, our own community, the scholars, who were, I don't want to say we were being lazy, but we were going to what we call the low-hanging fruit. That data were there in the technology transfer office. We get it, we put it into regressions, we publish it, we get tenure, and ended up with this impression that there's not a lot coming out of the university. So we, which is my... Uh, former doctoral student, Taylor Aldrich and I, decided to not to ask the universities what they do. We knew enough what the universities were doing from the technology transfer offices, but rather ask the scientists what they do. And working with the, uh, the Kaufman Foundation, and, um, which I understand you, you organized a conference with them not too, not too long ago, right, the Kaufman Foundation. They were interested, they got us interested in this issue actually, and they helped us procure um, uh, a database of the top scientists awarded grants from one of the federal agencies, the, Nas uh, the National Cancer Institute. The National Cancer Institute is one of the, is, is part of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health. And we got the scientists who were awarded the largest grants over a four year period. What we did was then to match these scientists to patents so we could see which scientists had been granted a patent. And we made the, I don't know, assumption or the, uh, uh, I guess the, the hunch that says, well, these scientists who get patents are more likely to commercialize than those who don't. So we had about 400 scientists. Uh, uh, and what we found, then what we did was, uh, we still didn't have any information about their commercialization activity we went to the Autumn da uh, database. We could see that some had licenses, some had patents. Uh, so that with the help of the Kaufman Foundation, we administered a survey to these scientists, and we found uh, that one in four had started a business. So this was a very different uh, sense of the commercialization, the entrepreneurial activity of scientists that we got when we asked them what they did, rather than ask the universities what uh, they do. I think many people uh, I hear just going around, I guess, the world, um, uh, I think it's the assumption that says, well, excellent scientists don't need to be entrepreneurial or they don't need to commercialize the research. Uh, they are star scientists. But in fact, this is really a database of just uh, superb, accomplished scientists. And what we found was one out of four of them had, had uh, started uh, a firm. So we, we could see that there was much more entrepreneurial activity than, um, than people had thought. Well, one of the limitations of that research was it focused just on one single field, cancer research. It was also limited to these highest performing scientists. This left uh, uh, the unanswered question of, is the high rate of entrepreneurial activity 
by these top star scientists in cancer. Is this typical of scientists in the United States, or is this particular to a field, cancer research, and maybe to very productive uh, 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 scientists? So that it, we also, so that we wanted to know if we have a broader sample of scientists that span different scientific fields, and also uh, a broader spectrum of scientific productivity, would we see the same kind of entrepreneurial activity of scientists? So that uh, we then had to um, create a, a scientist entrepreneurship database, and we did this by uh, uh, working with the Small Business Administration, where they helped us uh, uh, identify scientists who had received funding from the National Science Foundation. So again, we have scientists receiving uh, funding for their laboratories. That's not a, unusual between maybe a seven hour or eight hour, a year period. And then what we did was to do an online survey questionnaire. Now you can tell I didn't do this online survey questionnaire. I'm, uh, for me it's a good day when I can get on the internet. But my younger colleagues uh, administered this uh, web survey and we sent it out to the entire population of over 9,000 scientists. Um, we did this in several rounds and we ended up with um, we ended up with uh, uh, about 1,900 responses of the survey, about a response rate of 20 percent. I don't know if that's good or bad, but the scientists spanned not just one field but spanned six different fields of research civil and me mechanical engineering, environmental biology, computers, oceanology, particle and nuclear f astrophysics and biology. What we're after is really to identify how entrepreneurial are these scientists, first of all. And then second, I come from now the field of entrepreneurship. There's an enormous literature that can explain why do some people do it and other people don't do it, the it being entrepreneurship. And the literature focuses on characteristics like their age. Turns out younger people tend to do it more, not teenagers, but people, they tend to be more entrepreneurial than maybe more mature people. Um, males tend to do it more than females. Um, people, uh, uh, so there are these, these kind of characteristics. People with a higher education have a higher propensity to become uh, entrepreneurial. People with high social capital with connections, networks, and linkages this has all been established in the entrepreneurship literature. So we wanted to know, are scientists different from the general population? I suppose I was motivated by a conversation I had in Berlin a few years ago where I was up for a, a visit not unlike this. And we had a little meeting, not unlike yesterday, uh, uh, except it wasn't at the university. It was the Ministry of Economy or Industry in Berlin. And the minister... Uh, uh, said to me, she said, she said, Herr Aldrich, she said, uh, uh, we've been very frustrated by the lack of uh, biotech startups and life science startups. We understand that it's more prevalent in the United States. Uh, uh, can you tell us why there's more biotech and life science startups in the United States than here in Germany? And of course, I had no idea. Uh, but I said, well, uh, I think uh, uh, the incentive for people to be entrepreneurial is probably greater in North America than it is in Germany. And she thought for a minute and she said, she said, well, I hope you'll excuse me, Herr Audrey, she said, but everybody knows the Americans are greedy. And that was her explanation why they, they were more entrepreneurial. Maybe that's right, I, I don't know. But I think that uh, in my mind, I, I, I uh, and, and she went on to say, well, scientists are different. They do their work because they love their work. We're all, many of us are academics here, and I know we love our work, uh, but I'm not sure that we're so different from other people as well. So I think that we wanted to somehow see is what drives entrepreneurship for scientists different than what it, the, the literature has shown for the general literature. I'm not going to go into these hypotheses. It would take a, a course in entrepreneurship, and I'm sure other people are better uh, suited to teach that to you. But, one thing we know, age is important, um, uh, as I mentioned. That was a hypothesis. Females tend to be less likely to, every OECD country, I think all OECD country, uh, that's found that uh, males have a higher propensity to become an entrepreneur. Human capital, 
is positively related to becoming an entrepreneur. Social capital, I never liked the measurement of social capital in these studies. I don't like this way we measure social capital in our study either, uh, but that tells you about measure, measuring social capital. Uh, the technology transfer office should make a difference and access to financial resources should make a difference. Well, when we look at the results from our survey, what we found was uh, for all the different fields or scientific fields and for all the different scientists, we found about 13% of the scientists were starting a business. So it's not the one in four we found in the very smaller focused study, but 13% is higher maybe than people imagined. It says a lot of scientists are starting f businesses and nobody really knows about it um, because they're not going through the technology transfer office. Now in the literature, sometimes this is referred to as they're going out the back door and that's meant to be a bad thing. It implies that they're somehow stealing intellectual property from the university. I had a call from uh, uh, I think it was Nature Magazine about a few months ago when we were doing this research, I guess a preliminary version, it, it found its way to a reporter and the reporter said, we found, we, you know, we understand that, that your study's finding that scientists are, have a high propensity to start firms. And I was very proud. I thought I'd get quoted in Nature, so I was very excited. I said, yes, uh, make sure to spell my name right. And, uh, but the reporter wasn't interested in that. He says, he says what I'm going to do, he says, I'm going to bust those those uh, 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 thieves in California who are taking taxpayers' money and becoming millionaires off it. And that was the kind of article he was writing, a sense of, well, this 12.8% are taking uh, 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 research money that's funded by taxpayers, and then they're starting businesses. And, of course, mostly they don't get rich, but sometimes they do. So it was a very different... Uh, view that they said there's something uh, negative about this. But actually, I don't think this is going out the back door. My sense from talking to the scientists is, yes, they disclose their intellectual property to the Technology Transfer Office. The Technology Transfer Office had other priorities. This left the scientists free to pursue what they wanted. And uh, what comes of these firms started by the scientists is a different issue. Um, Sometimes you'll get firms like Google, and mostly you don't. Google wasn't started by scientists from Stanford. It was started by students. Mosaic was started by uh, that what Mozilla today. What's that? What's it called on the end? Mozilla Mosaic. Mosaic, right? It was Mozilla originally. It was started by some scientists or by students at the University of Illinois. So they weren't scientists. They wouldn't have been part of this. Uh, that's missing from our measurement. That's a kind of spillover from the university. Uh, but they started, I guess Mosaic was the first firm back in the 1980s. The University of Illinois thought that this was theft of their intellectual property, and they started a legal suit against these students for, le for intellectual property theft. The students dropped out of the university, moved to California, changed the name to Mozilla, and the rest is history. And I was visiting at the University of Illinois about a, year, about a year ago, and my, my host show, was showing me, just like the nice tour we had at the university here uh, uh, yesterday, my, my host was, was showing me the, the campus and said, ah, it was in that dormitory where these two students started Mozilla. He goes, they got rich and nobody can understand why they won't donate any money to the university. Well, of course, the university tried to put them in jail. That's probably not the best way to, uh, to treat alumni. The, uh, I'm sure the rector would, would agree. But my interpretation is that, uh, uh, in fact, we've done some analysis uh, that this is not, it's, you could say it's through the back door. It's not coming through the technology transfer, but it's not unethical. It's not illegal. When we did the survey, I realized this was an issue, so I advised my doctoral student, Taylor. I said, oh, let's ask each scientist if they've, notified the technology transfer office, the university, about their invention. And he said, that sounds like a good way to get a high response, right? You're basically asking them, have you committed a crime? And that didn't seem like a good idea. So we, we, we kept that question off. Uh, but OK, we can see in some of the, some of the scientific fields, in civil, civil me mechanical, 
um, engineering, uh, there's a, a really a pretty high rate of startup. Computer network systems, an even higher rate of startup, over one out of five scientists. Lower in environmental biology, uh, even lower in particle nuclear physics. We can imagine why that is. I don't understand the scientific fields, but I think you need a lot of, I think this is pretty basic. It's pretty far away from commercialization. Um, uh, I know I have the, the, uh, the uh, uh, rector of, a, of, a, of an engineering university here, so, uh, and also an engineer, so he, he can confirm that. Uh, biological infrastructure, I don't know what it is. I know it's got the word biology in, I have to confess. But we do see it varies, not surprising. We didn't really pursue yet too much. Why does this vary? But it does say the, the, the field of research clearly makes a difference. When we ask the question, are, and I, won't, I don't want to get bogged down in this, are the scientists in what drives their entrepreneurial decision, the decision to do it rather than not do it, are they different from the, the, the general population? Well, that the first two variables, they're really about the resources they have in terms of money. Having resources helps them become entrepreneurs. Um, you could think of students, in a way, as a, as a resource. Uh, that doesn't help them. I'm not sure why. Uh, their, their age or their stature in terms of tenure being a, a full professor doesn't matter. These are actually, this is a measure of social capital. If the scientist is uh, on a scientific board, she's got connections to the private sector, she's interacting and so on. This seems to be actually the most important variable at all. Scientists who have networks, connections with private industry are more likely to start a firm than those that don't. And then the actual uh, uh, attitude of the department, if the department encourages commercialization or if the department is ahead of an entrepreneur, that matters, although encouraging commercialization is negative, and that's kind of curious. You think, why if the department encourages commercialization, the scientist is less likely to become an entrepreneur? And this is kind of a nagging, I mean, my interpretation, one answer, I don't know, but I, th I think it's a nagging measurement issue. We've measured one mode, one way to commercialize, to start a business. But in fact, scientists can get their ideas out there with lots of other modes. They can license, they can uh, consult, they can have part-time work and so on. So I realized, well, when we maybe do it a bigger scale study, we need to look at the other kinds of modes of commercial, commercialization. It may be in, the, in those departments where you've got lots of kind of a culture of commercialization, the scientists resort more towards consulting, more towards part-time work and they don't have to resort towards, towards uh, starting a firm. I'm not quite so sure. Um, when we look at how this, these, these different factors influence uh, uh, the different entrepreneurship for the different fields, what we see is you can't say uh, any factor has the same impact on entrepreneurship with the exception of social capital. Social capital, um, which is measured by board membership, this seems to be important in every field in encouraging, uh, in encouraging uh, scientist entrepreneurship. So what do we conclude from all this? Well, one is that the entrepreneurship of scientists in, in the United States, there's a lot more of it, and it's a lot more robust than had been previously measured, uh, principally by the uh, data from the technology transfer offices. Most of the studies I've read on scientist uh, entrepreneurship or on university commercialization, licenses, patents. It's all about what the technology transfer offices are doing in the universities, not about what the scientists are doing. It clearly makes a difference which fields we're talking about. It's different for, um, it's different for cancer than it is for engineering. That's very clear. So I think as we move into the future, we need to be sensitive to the different types of, of scientific or more broadly academic fields. It doesn't seem like scientific, uh, scientific entrepreneurship exactly mirrors the determinants for the general population. Uh, I went through a fast. Human capital doesn't seem to measure ma matter for the scientists. But on the other hand, all these scientists have very high levels of human capital. So I'm not sure that really is so uh, such an important conclusion. Uh, uh, and finally, 
going back to what does this mean for the university in the entrepreneurial society? You know, I never defined, it's the title of the talk, I never really defined the entrepreneurial society. But in a way, if you think of the solo model, what was the solo model? Physical capital is the key to growth, jobs, competitiveness. The Romer model, knowledge, not physical capital, is the key to growth and jobs. In the entrepreneurial society, entrepreneurship becomes important just like knowledge. Knowledge isn't enough because of this knowledge filter. We need mechanisms, uh, it, not just from the university, but actually in industry as well, so that the, uh, uh, the entrepreneurs are really conduits, they're mechanisms for the spillover of knowledge is created in one organizational context. In this case, I'm talking about university, but the same thing's true in companies. There's lots and lots of examples of companies where you've got knowledge created in it, and then it hits a knowledge filter for lots of reasons. And then somebody, um, it's a great example of uh, at IBM in uh, baden württemberg where three young men had uh, uh, an idea, knowledge, that what IBM needed to do was to start to produce a new product, uh, a business software. So they do what you do in an organization. You go to your boss, your boss's boss, and you say, I've got this idea. And the boss and the boss's boss said, nice idea, but we don't think it's such a nice idea. Uh, we don't think there's any demand for the software. In any case, IBM makes computers, not software. Go back to work. Well, they were so passionate about the idea that they, uh, they, they asked other firms, nobody wanted to do it. Then they thought they'd start their own firm. So they went to the three main banks of Germany, the Dresdner Bank, the Deutsche Bank, the Commerzbank. The banks liked the idea, but they said, if we're any good, IBM would be doing it. So that didn't work. Finally, out of a family connection, they got kind of seedbed startup funding from a small regional bank near Heidelberg, and they started what's now SAP. Well, notice, that says the entrepreneurial act of leaving that company, in that case IBM, that knowledge was created in that organization. It was created by investments of IBM. They were paying the, the young men, they were probably paying for their training. Uh, society was paying for their university education, their high school education, and so on. They, they did what they were meant to do, they created the ideas, and then the organization, IBM said, but we don't think they're very good, or good enough. Well, the young men thought it was, and it took the entrepreneurship to start SAP to serve as the conduit for the spillover of knowledge. Then you've got the endogenous growth model, the mechanisms going. Now, once you've got the knowledge spillover, you get the growth, the jobs, and the competitiveness. Well, the same thing happens in the university. And so we can see that in the, um, in the entrepreneurial society, where entrepreneurship becomes key for facilitating these knowledge spillovers that uh, 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 the university becomes a very important institution, not just for the creation of knowledge, but also for mechanisms to facilitate getting that knowledge out into society. And I think what we've learned, not just in the United States, really in, in the OECD countries, is that it's not enough just to invest in the knowledge. Um, that results in what um, uh, the Swedes called the, uh, the Swedish paradox. And what the paradox was, they had the investments in knowledge in the, the 1990s and in the early years of this decade, but they weren't getting the growth. And there was a sense of that knowledge isn't getting out. It was hitting this, this knowledge filter. I remember Romano Prodi, I suppose no stranger to people in this room, when he was president of the European Commission, he liked that characterization of the Swedes. He took it for the, for the EU, and he called it the European paradox, where, again, the investments of knowledge seemed to be much higher than the rates of innovation. They weren't spilling over. And so that the university uh, be becomes a key institution that can serve as a catalyst for entrepreneurial activity, not just by investing and creating the knowledge through science, research, um, or through um, various activities at the university, not just through the kinds of transfer or spillover mechanisms by incubators, science parks, technology transfer centers, or entrepreneurship institutes, but uh, I think actually mostly by creating what you could call entrepreneurship capital. 
what entrepreneurship capital is is a kind of uh, understanding. What entrepreneurship's about, uh, the literature says, is uh, uh, it's the recognition of opportunities and then acting on those opportunities. That's what those scientists are doing who we've identified in this study. Uh, but an entrepreneurial society has to have a high level of entrepreneurship capital so that the general population is aware of either recognizing opportunities, creating opportunities, and then acting on those opportunities. Thank you very much. Ho dimenticato, grazie intanto David per questa relazione, ho dimenticato di dire che David e il professor Rodrich è contento anche di rispondere eventualmente a qualche domanda o sollecitazione, per, uh, sempre cercando di tenere i tempi stretti, ma se ci sono delle domande possono servire a chiarire o possono essere fatte anche in italiano visto che il... Sì, Andrea ha preso... Uh, thanks uh, for, for the very nice presentation. Uh, I have just one question on a very general level. I maybe come back to the introduction of your, of your presentation when you started speaking about the role of universities uh, and innovation and grow. And you, you also mentioned a lot the, the, the word jobs, which is extremely important in, in, the, in this uh, global and uh, long-lasting recession. And uh, I have in mind a very nice book by a colleague of yours in the US, but an Italian guy as well, which is Enrico Moretti, who wrote a, a very, very, very beautiful book on the geography of jobs. And uh, when basically what, what he says in the book is that uh, clearly universities and research are very catalyst for you know, the, the emergence of uh, our technological districts all around, all around the US, which creates new jobs, uh, richer jobs, uh, and also clearly inequality around, around the U.S. My question is, um, he, he also is able to show that there are good universities, good, very good research centers and universities scattered around the U.S., and some of them were not able to, to catalyze uh, uh, any, any technological district, are just some isolated place uh, around, around the U.S. So my question is, uh, What's your vision about the role of the university and which, are, which, are, which is the role of, of the public sector in order to foster the role of universities to promote uh, uh, local growth and, uh, and innovation? I very much uh, appreciate that question. And I think that between the time I was uh, perhaps in your shoes a student or a doctoral student, a young, stu a young uh, scholar in any case, uh, and now, back then, there was no role. There was no expectation that the university would contribute to the local community, the state community, the growth, the jobs. Um, the expectation was it would teach students, and that was about it. What's happened now, on my way to the airport two days ago, in Bloomington, I'm going to Indianapolis, and there's a big sign, and it says, Indiana University, creating jobs for Indiana. Now, many people say, oh, that's publicity, PR. The university pays for the sign and then hopes to get money from the legislature. Every state, in almost, or every un almost every university, feels it's not just a responsibility, I think it feels that its success depends on various degrees. Yes, being uh, excellent in research. The competition for research is intense. Excellent in teaching. The competition for students is intense. But also, the third is uh, community outreach, having an impact. And for a while, it was implicit. But now it's become very explicit. Not just Indiana University is a state university. That's true in North Carolina, Berkeley, but the private universities just as well because many of the stakeholders uh, care or have a vested interest in how the communities are doing, whether the community is um, a, a city, a state, a region. And they, if they can feel that the university can contribute and be part of the solution, 
they're willing to invest resources. So I'm always, I'm never really sure when I talk to some of the officials at the universities, including my own university, I have a meeting with uh, the vice president of the Office of Engagement. And I think that really he's more involved in publicity and marketing than he actually is in doing anything. But the two kind of go together. It's clearly in the university's interest to at least create a perception that it's having an impact because the, uh, the expectation, the need, the demand for that impact is there. And this is true of almost any university. Now the last, uh, another part of your question was, well the capability or the performance of the universities in achieving this is very uneven. That's for sure, but that shouldn't surprise us. Uh, there's always a distribution of whether it's productivity or output or performance. But one thing we know, I think we know, is that the expectation that this is a normal or an expected part of a university, I mean, it's complicated enough. I mean, I can feel the, the poor rector next to me thinking it's hard enough with these faculty and students and demands from various people for research and teaching and now, he has to create a successful full employment economy as well. But I think that, it, and it's not just certainly my university, I think it's throughout the United States, but I think we see this more and more in Europe too as well, that the stakeholders, whether it's uh, 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 the uh, uh, political bodies who actually make the investments in the university or the population, they're willing to invest in the university but only if they feel that they're getting a return. So I hope that answers the, the, the question. From your presentation, the, the main point, the focal point is that the ability, the entrepreneurial ability to transfer research and knowledge coming from research. Uh, but um, on the other side, there is a growing evidence of a, a number of universities, especially in the States, but even in Europe now, that are starting uh, teaching entrepreneurship. What is the OR? Okay, they, of course, they are not transferring research and the technology, but they are transferring capital or maybe knowledge about the entrepreneurial process. What, what do you think about this point? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that question because uh, if I reflect back to how I started the talk when I was a student, there were no courses at all. I mean, I think there were none. I, I, I'm sure Wisconsin didn't. I'm sure uh, they, they just didn't exist. And then you had a few, they were at the margin, looked at the university looked down on, now they really spread. And I, I honestly I'm ambivalent about them because I think that uh, many of the entrepreneurs I talked to, including these scientists, I mean I went through this, we actually talked to the, that's, that's why this research is interesting. You talk to very uh, interesting creative scientists and I don't think any of them I've talked to actually, should I, we should put this on the question, have you had a class in entrepreneurship? I would feel embarrassed to ask that question. It seems so, you know, uh, 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 but they, uh, so I'm not sure that it's essential for them. Some of the uh, uh, people I know were entrepreneurs. They didn't, they I think they feel that they do what they do and, but they can do it the best in an entrepreneurial a firm they started. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I think that in creating entrepreneur, what I roughly call entrepreneurship capital, that means it's an awareness. What is this force about? What does it take? And I think that I could say, oh, if say IBM, which almost went out of business in the 90s, if they'd understood entrepreneurship, they wouldn't have had that disaster that they had. Perhaps Nokia now, if they understood the entrepreneurial forces, perhaps they'd make decisions differently. That is, they have to kind of understand what happens when you have knowledge and people are gonna take that knowledge and compete against you, basically. And I would say for policy makers, I think that uh, certainly in the United States, but I think in Europe too, many of the policy makers at the city, state, national level, if they understood entrepreneurship, I think that their policy approach would be different in 
in many different areas. So in that sense, I think these classes are very important, not just to people who are going to start firms, but maybe in some ways for the people who won't start the firms. Uh, uh, Just a small question about your research. Uh, did you check, uh, David, uh, for the role played by external factors like venture capitalists, like uh, partners having managerial capabilities in order to uh, help these scientists to start a business? No, and that's, and that's missing because you're right. Clearly, the, we put in dummy variables for the, uh, whether it's in the Midwest, the West, I could, but the answer is really no. I think that's clearly where the research needs to go. It's a sensitivity to the other kind of contributors in a place that is these decisions being made, not in isolation, that's for sure, right? Um, and so you're clearly right to say we need to include external factors, the finance, uh, access to finance. We've got uh, the grant finance, but that's not really, it would be the, the pre I mean, we have a sense of people who are in the Bay Area have much quicker finance to access to angel capital, venture capital, and so on. And I think that, I think you're right. Those, those things need to come in. Thanks, David, for your presentation. I'm Matteucci from this university. I was speaking last year with Luke Sute, which is the director of Maastricht, now rector of Maastricht University. He was saying, uh, you know why uh, Dutch spin-offs are more efficient than German ones? Just because they are within a country which is less bureaucratic and less uh, burdensome in their procedure with respect the, the German ones. So it was very straightforward in pointing to a factor that it seems to me that it's highly relevant in order to judge the European system for the transfer of technology. When you have a national system of innovation, when you have a public administration which is not conducive to knowledge transfer, innovation, creation, the startup even without venture capital consideration, is going to be the main uh, weak point of the system. So I don't want to discuss the Italian case because otherwise we are too campanilistic in this respect. But I think that even for uh, Mediterranean countries, Spain, Greece, this is a main factor to be taken into account, even before venture capital considerations. So national system of innovation, this is the big problem. This is my view, but I want to know your idea because you visited a lot the European experiences. Which is your view of the European situation in this respect? Well, I, I totally agree with you. It's actually the bureaucratic impediments is probably the bar greatest barrier to perhaps that and the, the social capital somebody has. But I think the, the bureaucratic, that can be the greatest impediment, uh, and I think it's a problem everywhere. One of my um, friends, my college roommate back in those 10 years when I was studying, uh, he became the founder of, he was working for a semiconductor company called Cadence, it was the sixth biggest firm in Silicon Valley. At some point he thought the company should do something different, the board disagreed, he had 20 minutes to get out, and he started eSilicon and made the first microprocessor in the um, iPod. So he's done pretty well with his company, eSilicon. Well, I had him speak at a conference recently, and his talk was why I love Silicon Valley. It was great to have an entrepreneur talk about how great it is. And then halfway through he goes, now the second half of my talk is going to be why I'm going to leave it. He said, I'm moving all my operations to Vietnam. He said, 
because the bureaucratic impediments are too great in Silicon Valley. He says, I wanted to knock down a wall to expand. I had to get permission from the zoning, from the mayor, all these things. And you could tell he was really upset by, it wasn't to start the company, it was to grow the company, I suppose. But I think even in Silicon Valley, uh, bureaucratic impediments, I mean, uh, are, are really a problem. Now then you ask, is it worse in Europe? Well, I guess the Silicon Valley example shows it's pretty bad every place. My sense is it, it's hard to generalize about Europe. As you said, Luke seems to think those impediments aren't so severe in the Netherlands. I would suppose Luke is right. I could imagine they're more severe. My sense is that that, it, that is a, a problem, an issue in Germany. But we also know within any, any one country, I mean, I've seen the maps that um, of, of startup activity by province or by region or by land or by Kais in Germany or in, in all the countries. And you always see, or in France, right, Spain, you always see a lot of spatial variation. Some places have more of it, some places have less of it. And I think even though some of these impediments are national sp specific for sure, some of them are more local as well. So it's hard to generalize about the United States. I think it's clearly much more difficult. Um, I've seen studies, Michigan is more difficult. There's more impediments than there is in California. It's interesting, uh, including a non-compete clause that they enforce. So if you leave a company and start a company, you may go to jail. That's a kind of an impediment, right? And it's, in California, they don't enforce it. Um, th I think the difficulty is that these impediments consist of thousands and thousands of thousands of different little, relatively small. But I, I, I agree with you. It's, a, it's, it's really, for me, that's where I would look for policy uh, is, is what you said, reducing these impediments. And I think some places are, are, have done better in Europe than other places. Uh, Luke seems to suggest the Netherlands uh, in this, this area of this region of Ronstadt between Rotterdam and, uh, and uh, Amsterdam. Certainly the data show this. I know in Germany you can see Bavaria Munich has done very well. Um, uh, 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 Hamburg has done very well. But then there's other re parts of Germany that really just really have trouble generating uh, entrepreneurial activity. And I, so I, th I think you're right. I think those impediments, those bureaucratic impediments, it's interesting. That's what um, Senator Bai was looking at actually in that slide. He was looking at one in terms of intellectual property rights, but that's just one, one, uh, one, one example. I appreciate that point very much. Sono, ringrazio per, per l'intervento, sono d'accordissimo con l'ultimo intervento, cioè abbiamo un po' di burocrazia intorno al discorso della ricerca vera e propria. E trovo però alcuni, alcuni punti molto, eh, molto particolari, molto difficili a risolvere. Prima di tutto, e ne abbiamo parlato prima, riguarda la protezione della proprietà intellettuale, un percorso molto complesso, molto lungo, che spesso... Eh, demotiva il ricercatore, anche perché poi le, mh, eh, il pagamento del brevetto non consiste solo nella formulazione del brevetto, ma anche nel, nel mantenimento del brevetto stesso e nell'estensione, perché io posso fare un brevetto in Italia, ma poi arriva eh, una persona dalla Cina che fa lo stesso prodotto e poi lo vende, lo vende da noi. Quindi eh, sono d'accordissimo nel, nel discorso della necessità di strutture che si occupano di seguire anche queste tematiche e sono d'accordo nell'educazione all'imprenditorialità del, del, del ricercatore stesso ma al di là del, ehm, 
dello scopo diciamo, di rilanciare un'economia knowledge based e non vedo la motivazione del professore universitario a lanciarsi eh, in un'avventura di, di tipo imprenditoriale mi riallaccio al discorso degli spin off università e universitari noi eh, in ingegneria ne abbiamo moltissimi questi spin off ma sono per lo più società di consulenze cioè, perché io dovrei abbandonare il mio posto e lanciarmi in questa impresa quando il trasferimento tecnologico comunque lo metto in atto attraverso accordi di, di, di licensing, scusate la pronuncia in inglese, quindi il mio guadagno consiste nel, nel, nelle royalties sostanzialmente. Perché, quali sono altre motivazioni? Oh yeah, it's a good uh, opportunity to thank the, the translator. I, uh, uh, all through this time I could understand uh, very well what people were saying, including, 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 no, I think it's okay, including that question. Uh, that's a, and it's a great question. What are the motivations? And I, I would suppose uh, we thought a little bit about asking people, why are you doing this? Um, in some ways, the, the entrepreneurship literature itself has been tortured about what motivates people to do it, to become an entrepreneur, rather than why not just take a job? What are these motivations? Now we know we have necessity and uh, opportunity entrepreneurs. Um, I have a sense from talking to these, to, to some degree, this sense of people. And I, I, I think it's the same sense I get from the general public. Now, of course, the general public, there's many, many different motivations. Um, uh, each entrepreneur is, person is, is unique. Um, so sometimes, uh, very frequently, I think for the general population, uh, we see people want to, uh, they, want, they have an idea, they want to do something, and they can't do it in any other way context, organization. They can't do it the way they want to. That's why they become an entrepreneur. I think for many of these scientists, it's really the same thing, my sense of talking to them. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, scientists here is a, uh, uh, is a scientist at the, uh, the University of Illinois. And so I went over and he wouldn't answer the, uh, the survey, so I drove about... Uh, uh, about four hours over and, and, and got him and, and talked to him. He was, he was really happy to talk. And what had happened to him, he was doing research on, he was, a, um, he, was, he, was, he was doing research trying to solve cancer, I understand, or understood. And to solve cancer, he needed uh, rats. And his specialty, so he started to, to produce uh, fat, male rats with diabetes, and then he would uh, uh, do his experiments on the rats. Well, I guess colleagues around the country uh, realized he had these rats, so they would ask him for the rats. So he started growing more and more. Pretty soon, the colleagues at the university started to complain. He was taking all the laboratory space, and he was making everything smell bad, like rats. So they told him he couldn't do this anymore. This is the point when he uh, started his own company so that he could keep growing these rats. He could sell them. He could do his research. He was, uh, I'm sure he was making money. Um, uh, uh, he, never, he didn't talk about that. But that's my sense of a general pattern, is that they do it because they can pursue the activities that they want to in this organizational context. At some point, the university becomes limited, um, maybe because they want to move towards commercialization. They want to see their idea be important, be realized. I mean, many times they hand the ideas off. We know this as well. But that's only one impression I have. And I will say, when I, if I think back to when, when, where I started in the talk when I was a student, I would have thought, too, no professor wants to. Why make the effort of getting involved in the commercialization. But now seen from today's perspective, I think because they can realize their goals, they can self-actualize, I think is what the psychologists call it. Uh, this becomes a component of their research, their teaching. It's all kind of integrated. 
they can hire students, they can do research in the company that furthers, uh, and I think in some ways they get a more varied life. Uh, uh, it gives them another dimension. Um, but I think really what you have is a great research question. Uh, I think that we've only started, I guess for the, the younger people, I would just say, I, I really tried to emphasize, we haven't really asked scientists what they do in terms of commercialization. We haven't asked them why. So I guess I'd turn it back to you and say, here's a great research project for you and, and your colleagues to do. Abbiamo una, c'era un'altra answer, però deve essere telegrafica la risposta, domanda e risposta. Just a very short question. My, my question is about the additional skills. So if you have analyzed the aspect of additional skills, uh, useful to, for the scientists to start up, to, to create a new business, because I think it's another important uh, aspect uh, for scientists to become entrepreneurs. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, we don't have that at all. You know, it, I went through this very fast, but in the questionnaire, we don't ask that. It kind of gets to the last question, it kind of gets to your question too. To what degree do these people have the skills? To what degree do they acquire the skills? I do have a sense, again, talking to scientists, just a sense that the kinds of people who go in, especially to life sciences now, chemistry to some degree, certainly uh, uh, computer science, they're different than the people who went into it maybe 20 years ago. They have this in mind as part of the career that yes, they want to be a professor at Stanford or Berkeley, and yes, they want to do great research, but of course, they want to be involved in uh, uh, commercialization because this is what all the important people do. Um, so they, they probably come in more prepared. But I don't really, uh, I don't, I think this is also is important. To what degree do they have the skills? Do they, to what degrees are the, are the lack of skills a barrier to entrepreneurship? I don't sense that that's really a barrier because they will partner with people, they can find people. Uh, but then as you pointed out, more and more programs we see in engineering schools for sure. But we see the Kaufman Foundation played a big role in this. One of their great initiatives under the former president of the foundation, uh, Carl Schramm, was he, he didn't like business schools. He thought business schools were not very valuable. So what he wanted to see was entrepreneurship taught, what he called it, across the curriculum, I think. He looked for entrepreneurship programs in the sciences, in the social sciences, in engineering schools, in law schools, in a way, going back to what you said about the training, but also what you said, so that when people are in the position, maybe they don't know exactly what to do, but they know more about it. But the last point couples with the previous question about the impediments. I would suppose if you're at a place where the bureaucratic barriers to entrepreneurship are relatively low, and you've got the support system there, this it's, you don't need so many skills. You can hire the skills. They're out there. And I think this has been pointed out, I guess, by entrepreneurship capital, what I would mean would be a place where those kind of services that entrepreneurs need are, are there. But it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a great question to pursue. It kind of couples with what's the appropriate role of entrepreneurship education? Do you give it to people before they've even thought about commercializ commercializing? Do you wait till they need it? Um, I think these are all questions that nobody's really, pe different places experiment, but I don't think we've really, you know, as you said in your question, just to be able to offer an entrepreneurship course seems like that's an achievement. And now we've got to worry about who do we offer the course to, at what point in their career, and so on. I would say, though, we're seeing more and more experiments. I notice uh, I have more and more colleagues who are teaching entrepreneurship but they're teaching it in an entr in a uh, 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 engineering school. They're teaching it in a law school. There, this seems to be something that matters to a broader set of uh, scholars. Anyway, it may be useful to be the son of a banker. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it may be useful to be the son of a banker. Yes, that, that's always maybe that's the strategy. 
Va bene, bene, credo che se non ci sono altre domande non mi rimane che ringraziare molto David, il professor Odrech per questo contributo. Ringraziare voi per l'attenzione e alla prossima lezione di Economia Marche.